Hello, and thanks for streaming The Near Futurist, a show presented by me, Guy Clapperton. This is a fortnightly look at the technologies that are going to affect our lives in, you guessed it, the near future. In this episode, we're looking once again at education, this time at university education, and how it's having to evolve in the light of coronavirus. It was changing anyway, to be honest. The generation that's there now grew up with social media and probably thinks Facebook is something like an online old people's home, even if the latest redesign does make it end up looking like a big smartphone on your computer. Hate it. To discuss this, my guest is a chief executive and founder of Orla, as well as a member of the Board of Governors at London Metropolitan University. Previously, he was co-founder of Project Access, a global widening participation charity. His name is Anders Krohn. Anders, welcome. Thanks a lot, Guy. It's great to be here. Okay, first of all, tell me about Aula, and particularly if I've mispronounced it and it's actually Aula, and what you do. It is Aula. Well, yes, I'm happy to tell you. Maybe we should start with, with why we do it, and maybe I can give a quick background to, to myself. So I'm, great. I'm originally from Denmark. I grew up there, just north of Copenhagen, for about 18 years. And then I, when I was 18, I went on this quite fascinating and pretty unusual educational journey, starting out in the rural south in the U.S., right in between... Atlanta and Alabama and studying at a, at a former community college. And that was really when I started to get interested in education and the impact that educational institutions can have on regions and the impact that individual educators can have on students' lives. I then went on to study a bit in the UK and China, US and Denmark. And really a lot of what we're doing at OWL today is based on my own experiences as a student. The thing that was always clear to me is the no one denies the impact of education on, on social mobility and the importance of education to society. But at the same time, it's also very clear that as a student, you have some classes where it's just brilliant. It's changing your life every single day. And then you have somewhere that's very much not the case. And the reason for that is that it's really, really hard to get education right. It's really hard to teach. And so really our mission at Aula is to make it easy for all educators to create high quality digital learning experiences. We describe ourselves as the learning experience platform for higher education. And the problem that we solve for universities such as University of West of Scotland or Coventry University is that they know that the digital learning experience is key to student retention. But at the same time, educators don't have the time or the capabilities to create high quality digital learning experiences that meet students' needs and make them want to stay. And so the way we solve this problem for institutions is that by combining easy to use technology, taking everything we've learned from platforms such as Slack or such as Facebook or WhatsApp, and combining that with one-to-one -one learning design support for every educator. And so if you imagine you're, you're an educator guy and you have a, a set of slides you would normally use for solely face-to-face -face teaching, then on average, it would probably take you about 80 hours to change that into an active and community-centered digital learning experience. With Aula, it takes eight hours instead of eight hour, 80 hours of your time. And it is much easier to create those active and community-centered experiences that we know from the research is so important to student retention. So, I mean, universities have been faced with these impossible challenges uh, just immediately. You're talking about changing things from an inert slide, if you like, to a community and active slide. Could you be a bit more specific about what these are, what the changes are? What, what, what actually are the uh, tutors doing? Yes. <laughs> so if we talk, talk about what they were doing, so the sort of before is that many educators, they would have a set of slides, they would lecture for, let's say, a couple of hours, and the students would sit in a lecture theater. But really what we want to do in order to support student retention is to have the students as much more active participants in their own education. And so rather than just doing these lecture-based classes where the educator is sort of reading at the students, we, what we want is we want the students to be able to work together. We want them to be active participants. And so you could imagine that if you were to learn linear algebra, rather than just having a, a, a set of slides that are presented to you every week, you would work with other groups of students on specific challenges for that week. You would present it to each other. You would get more frequent feedback and really just a much more active learning experience that means that students learn more, but it also very much contributes towards the student retention, which is so important uh, financially and from an impact perspective for these institutions. 
Okay, now I coach people in presentation and in talking to the media, so we're talking adult education there, and I'm also not so much a qualified as an experienced tutor in that respect, so it is a different world, I accept that. I do it over Zoom or Teams or whatever people want. Lectures can be done in the same way, but it sounds to me as though you're not fixing the remote experience. You're fixing what we call in the trade lousy slides. I'm just not wondering whether you're actually fixing something that's unique to the remote world of uh, presentation or whether you're fixing something that uh, the students needed fixing anyway, because the current generation is expecting interaction. They're expecting uh, this uh, social element to, uh, uh, to a lecture and the old fashioned uh, you're, here's the inert slide, I'm just going to talk at you. That was on the way out anyway, wasn't it? I mean, obviously, some, some lectures can be good, but I would say the overall, the, the sort of solely lecture-based format was quite problematic already. And what we're doing is not unique to just the sort of remote world. It's really about enabling institutions to make that pedagogical shift to create learning experiences that meet students' needs and make them want to stay. And so you're you're exactly right. It's not just about remote. The good thing is that a digital experience does sometimes make it easier for the educator to make this transition because it's easier to sort of uh, scaffold that, that journey that the students are, are going on. And it's easier for the educator, for example, to use templates or to think about how they run their class again and again. And so digital can definitely help us, but you're exactly right that this is not about fixing, so to say, the, the remote experience. It is very much about changing the sort of underlying principles of how we want education to operate and move away from, as you're calling it, the lousy slides or what some people have called the Zoom from your room <laughs> or whatever they all call it, towards something that actually creates a learning experience that is much more active, much more community centered. And actually where, where I would push back a, a tiny bit is that, so you, it's, I think you're you're basing your question a bit on a sort of generational uh, premise that the reason that this shift is relevant now is because students are are younger, so to say, than than lecturers. First of all, that's that's definitely not the case at all uh, institutions. For example, the university that I sit on the board of, London Metropolitan University, have a high proportion of of mature students. The same at University of West of Scotland, which is one of our our big partner institutions. And so, regardless of age. This is really just what do we know about how humans learn and what is the teaching that ensures that as educational institutions, we can ensure that we build experiences that really support students' needs and also make them, make them want to stay. Okay, that leads on to the uh, question about attention spans. I'd like to know a little bit about the psychology behind this. I keep getting told, for example, again, as somebody who uh, tutors adults in a less, less formally structured way, but I keep getting told that people won't watch an online presentation for very long if they have an attention span of 15 minutes at best, and then you'd better vary it somehow. But then they'll go and watch a movie for two hours and it's fine. They don't expect to interact with a movie. Um, I'm just wondering what exactly is happening in our minds there. Why do people feel they have to put these online presentations into chunks? Yeah, <laughs> good question. So, so I think the, the nature of attention spans and whether there are some sort of, there is some research that's coming out now about whether sort of brains are changing as a consequence of the way that technology works and, and whether that impacts attention spans. I think probably a better way to think about it is in terms of like interest spans that just people just lose interest. And in as you're saying, it's not a problem for Netflix, for example, to ensure that people watch something that takes two hours and that that can be hard to sort of quote unquote to compete with for someone who is who is lecturing. I think the real reason for us wanting to chunk things up is not so much just about attention spans. It's about being able to, if you imagine the educational experience as a sort of as a journey or as if you could imagine as a, as a movie you would not you would want some variation in there you want to make sure that let's say for example rather than having two hours of of listening to to a lecture you have maybe 15 minutes with one key point you then check your understanding with a quiz or you have a conversation with one of your peers and it's really about making sure that that variation is sort of interwoven across the the educational experience whether there is a sort of more topical thing around attention spans changing, that might be the case. But to be honest, I'm not sure I have the credentials <laughs> to, to, to claim that here. But I think either way, there is a lot of good reasons why a learning journey, 
should have some variation to ensure that students progress and that the right elements are, are, are present throughout that, that journey. What has changed though, is that I think if you, if you compare where we are now with where we were 30 years ago in terms of education, is that we actually now have some quite solid evidence about what contributes towards these high impact practices, these practices that we know will have a positive impact on learning outcomes, whether that is grades or whether that is retention. And so the real question we ought to ask ourselves as educators or as educational institutions or as technology companies for that sake, is how do we ensure that these practices are embedded in the way that we teach and in the experience that we provide to our students. Do you want to sound as confident as my interviewee in this episode? If you talk to the press or other media, are you worried you'll be misquoted, or they'll just publish their story and not yours? Clapperton Media Associates can help with coaching. Drop me a note, guy at clapperton.co.uk, and we'll arrange a time for an exploratory call. Now, back to the podcast. That makes sense. And of course, 35 years ago, when I was at college, or 30 years ago, I'm sure it's very similar. We just didn't have those options because the technology wasn't yet in place. We were just talking about word processes being very exciting things. I'm making myself sound very old. I'm going to move on to the next question. <laughs> a longer term, this stuff was evolving nicely. People were starting to use more interaction, whether it's classroom education, lectures education, adult education. And suddenly coronavirus made it an imperative how has your business changed? How quickly did you have to adapt? We had to adapt very fast because our partner institutions had to adapt very fast. So what was interesting was that before the pandemic hit, we had already started to run some experiments with Coventry University where we took our technology platform, which you can imagine is a bit like a sort of taking some of the things we've learned from WhatsApp or Slack or other more conversational tools. And we wanted to combine that platform with what we call learning design. And learning design is really about making sure that each class or module is structured in a way that embeds these high impact practices that I mentioned before. And so we'd run a couple of experiments in, about that. That was probably around February time, I think. And then obviously the, the pandemic hit. And what was interesting was that we then had the opportunity to, to work with Coventry at a slightly bigger scale uh, to take some of the modules that were previously delivered solely face to face and move them into a hybrid format where some of it was online, some of it was fully online, some of it was mixed in between and really use the technology and the learning design capabilities to support those educators in, in creating high quality at uh, digital learning experiences. And so in early May, we did our first fully online module that went through this transformation process, which reduces the time it takes for an educator from 80 hours of their time to eight hours of their time. And by now, we have done just north of uh, 1,500 of these transformed modules. So at its peak this summer, we had a more than 150 freelance learning designers uh, sort of designing on top of the Aula uh, platform in, in partnership with educators across our, our partner institutions. And so we've very much adjusted. We've changed our pricing. We've changed our business model. We've changed our product. And, and a lot of that is just based on research, like talking with students and educators, what would it take to basically say like, well, now we're forced to, to do some of the things that some universities were, were planning to do anyways and make that experience as good as possible. And, and the thing that really makes me the most proud is when I get emails from educators who are saying, this was the first time I was teaching online. It was also the first time I received 100% student satisfaction. And that to me is just so brilliant. And because it is really, really hard to get it right. And some of these educators have just done an, done an absolutely brilliant job. I'd like to talk about the students a little bit. Uh, they refresh every few years or there's a new intake every year, of course. So you've got this perennially young population. The lectures and tutors, I mean, there is some turnover, but um, they don't change quite so rapidly. How do you keep them up to speed? And I know you've mentioned that uh, this isn't necessarily a generational thing before. Yeah. And I do agree. I'm in my mid-50s myself, and it, it's not. Uh, we will get this technology stuff. But how do you keep these tutors who might have been there for, say, 20 years or something up to speed? 
Yeah, well, I, I will say it again. <laughs> it, is, it is not a generational thing. It is more of, I would say, capabilities and a confidence thing. And it's certainly the case that sometimes that can vary between students and their, their tutors or, or, or educators. And so to me, really, the question we have to ask ourselves is, how do we enable all educators to create these high quality digital learning experiences? And there's a couple of things at play there. There's one that's around time. So a lot of educators, if not all educators, have a lot of pressures on their time. And so we need to find ways to really enable them to make shifts in their pedagogy to use digital in different ways without just it being a massive burden on their time. So that's something we're very, very focused on uh, at ALA. And then there's something that's around just capabilities and confidence. And this is where we really work in, in partnership with the universities that, that we partner with to make sure that there are, there is training, there are resources available for educators to make this switch, which as you mentioned before, is not just about digital, it's really about digital and pedagogy. And the secret sort of sauce we have at Aula is that we just want to be the best company out there when it comes to combining exceptional pedagogy with easy to use technology. Because if you do it just about technology, I think there's now enough uh, examples of just throwing technology into schools or into universities and not much happens. Really what we want to do is we want to combine that with a culture change, with a pedagogical change so that the student experience changes. Because at the end of the day, what it's all about is about the learner outcomes. Okay, it's very easy to get a little bit doom and gloom uh, about uh, the current situation. Um, we're recording in November. Uh, my country, the UK, is about to go back into uh, lockdown this week. The promise is that it will be out by the time this podcast comes out, but people are doubting that uh, already. So it probably isn't there forever, but it's been, or it might feel like it. So hopefully one day it'll be beaten back or we'll accommodate it somehow. Um, What's your exit plan from uh, this rapid change and this rapid evolution? Or do you think these uh, changes are with us permanently? Yes, no doubt. And what makes me say that is that I, I did some interesting research a bit more than a year ago where I read through basically every education strategy for every university in the UK. And what's interesting is that all universities were sort of going in this direction, one of the words that was mentioned the most is flexibility. It's about providing students the flexibility to, for example, study from anywhere at any time, or the flexibility, if you're a nurse, to be able to study whilst you're in a hospital, or the flexibility to do an internship whilst you're studying. And really what digital does is that it enables that flexibility. And the universities knew that they were already moving in that direction. And so what I like to say is that really what the coronavirus has done to the education space overall is it's not really just a new normal it's just or not just it is an acceleration of the arrival of the future that the universities were already planning for and some of them had planned for that to take decades they didn't have that option um, and there is no doubt that obviously the pandemic has led to enormous amounts of stress it has consequences that are are really Horrifying, um, but if, if we had to be optimistic about it there, I think from an educational perspective, what it has done is has led to an acceleration of some of these practices that the universities were already trying to roll out. And to me, there is no doubt that that will stay and that the universities that get, do get this right and do it successfully will come out on the other side of the pandemic, having learned a lot about their students, having learned a lot about their educators and what it takes to actually deliver on these big strategic plans that all universities have. And I think when I talk with vice chancellors or provosts or other university leaders, what's really quite interesting is that the, the pandemic has sort of given them insights into, for example, their student demographic that they previously didn't really have to the same extent. One example is digital poverty. If we want to teach more uh, online or if you want to have more online components as part of our education, how do we think about the devices that students have access to? How do we think about the difference between students who are studying from a home where they don't have their own room or students who are always commuting? How, and, and getting those things right, to me, is really key to be able to create this future of education that is much more flexible, that is much more evidence-based when it comes to embedding 
everything we know about how humans learn. Okay, and my final question then is, um, where can people find out more about yourself and Aula? Yeah, so Aula, you can go to our website, which is aula.education. Uh, uh, to find more about myself, I'm, I'm fairly active on uh, LinkedIn, so you can just drop me a message there, or my email address is anders, A-N-D-E-R-S, at aula.education. And uh, for anybody who's wondering, Aula is A-U-L-A, which is, of course, why, as an ignorant British person, I pronounced it Aula in the first <laughs> instance. If you make a mistake like that, just don't draw attention to it, and you'll probably get away with it. Anders Cohn, Chief Executive of Aula, thank you very much for joining me. It was a pleasure. Thanks a lot. And many thanks to you for listening. That was the Near Futurist podcast with me, Guy Clapperton. Don't forget to have a look at the website at nearfuturist.co.uk or my media training site at remotemediatraining.com. I won't be back in two weeks' time because uh, this is the last episode of the year. It's early December as this goes out. But in two weeks' time, it will, of course, be almost Christmas. So have a great time. Have a great break. I know it's been a weird year. Let's hope that 2021 is a better one, although that's what we said in uh, 2019, to be fair. Um, but I hope but you have a great time. I hope you have some uh, relaxing time. I will see you in the new year. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.